Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? That's affirmative. We are ready. CNN International, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Station. CNN International, how do you hear me? CNN, we got you loud and clear on the International Space Station. Fantastic. Lovely to meet you. I'm Robin Kerner. I'm coming to you from the CNN Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Just wanted to know where you are right now. Where are you above the Earth? Uh, you know, when we last checked, we were passing Australia. I'm not sure where we are right at this very moment, but uh, we're up here about 250 miles up somewhere. Somewhere. What's it like up there? What is it like to feel spaceless in the space? Must be an amazing feeling. It is truly incredible, Robin. I mean, it doesn't get old. I've been up here two and a half, almost three months, and every morning I wake up, I float down the passageway, and I honestly think, is this really happening? It does not get old. It's, it's fabulous. You're going to be doing some spacewalks. One of you's done a spacewalk already. Uh, you've got a few more lined up in the, in the coming weeks. I mean, what is that like? Again, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, when you get outside, there's no atmosphere to obstruct any light. There's no dust particles. It's absolutely clear. I spit shined my visor before I went out because I knew this, and it, it is an amazing view. You know, 360 degrees as you turn your head, about 160 degrees that you can see from side to side. Uh, the beauty of the Earth and all the magnificent colors, it is absolutely thrilling. But, regrettably, there's minimal time for that because... 98% of the time we're outside, we're actually very, very busy accomplishing the tasks that are set before us. Are you nervous about going on your first spacewalk, though, sir? Well, I'm, I'm not nervous at all. Um, we've had a lot of great training from the folks on the ground in Houston, and uh, Butch is going to be the spacewalk lead on that one. So I'm not nervous about it. I'm, I just want to make sure that we get all the work done. Every time you go outside, that's kind of the main focus, and we need to make sure uh, that that goes well. Uh, you've been posting photographs to Twitter. It's an amazing connection with you guys up there. I mean, you seem to have a fondness for clouds. I mean, obviously, as you're going and orbiting around the Earth, the smallest things look so beautiful, isn't it, I'm, sure, I'm assuming? It, it does. We're, we just passed out the southern tip of South America, and we're as close as we can get to Antarctica right now. And the other day, it was actually clear in Antarctica, and I got a chance to see the continent for the first time. But the clouds in the southern hemisphere, especially the southern ocean especially, are always amazing. Funny, it's funny you say it's about you tweeting and clouds because just this morning I sent a picture see. down that had a, uh, the peak of a volcano at the Galapagos Items peaking above the clouds. I think it'll be an interesting thing people may like to see. Okay, we'll go and check on it when we get off air. But, I mean, you also got to see the devastation, perhaps, or the power of Mother Nature. Amazing photographs from space over, about that typhoon. Yeah, that, that was, uh, it was amazing to see, and when we were in the cupola looking at it, I thought, man, this thing is amazing, it's beautiful, but the bad part about it is it's a dangerous storm. Um, I know that personally, Hurricane Andrew came right over my house 20 years ago in South Florida, and I knew that was a pretty dangerous storm. Unfortunately, people uh, lost their lives there in the Philippines, so our thoughts and prayers were with them, but um, to see it at night was especially amazing. We had a full moon uh, this past week, and you could see a, a typhoon, at night. It was amazing to see that from space. Just watching you uh, on my monitor, obviously the weightlessness uh, must be uh, hard to describe. I mean, do you spend a lot of time being like a kid and just doing somersaults for the sake of it? Yes. <laughs> it's um, every day at least once I, we just say, man, this is great floating. It's so much fun. You can uh, there's nothing, you can't describe it because it doesn't really exist on Earth. You can be weightless for maybe one or two seconds, or if you, there's some airplanes that do zero-G flights where they push over for about 20 seconds of weightlessness, but here it never ends, and your body adapts to it, which has been a lot of fun to see, experience how your body learns how to walk and move around in space. It's kind of like being one again, learning how to walk on Earth, um, except for we have to learn immediately.
one good thing about zero or weightless system this time of year is at one moment your Christmas tree can be on the ceiling and then just a couple of seconds later it can be on the floor. So that's very handy as well. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it is. It looks very handy. Uh, some serious questions, though. I mean, you're all in a very small environment, uh, so far away, and there's been so much political, geopolitical tension between Russia and the West and the U.S. How do you deal with those kinds of uh, issues that are happening on the ground when you're really needing to coexist up there together? Yeah, there, there's no differences or problems here at all. Our Russian crewmates are, are great friends. Um, all, during the day, we're all working together, and at nighttime, I always uh, be sure to spend some time, 30 minutes or an hour with those guys, watching TV, speaking Russian, and, and uh, we get along very well as a crew, and uh, we, we have no problems at all. So uh, whatever's happening on the ground, it's definitely not happening here on the space station. Because you had to learn Russian, and obviously the, the U.S. space program relies heavily on the Russian space program. You, you get there on, on uh, uh, Russian craft. We do. Uh, I just launched two and a half weeks ago on a Russian Soyuz, and uh, right now that's how all of our astronauts are getting up with the Russians. Uh, both programs work together. Uh, we both rely on each other. Uh, the Americans bring an awful lot to the table in the International Space Program, and the Russians do also, as do the Europeans, the Japanese, and the Canadians. So this truly is an international space station. Um, and I wouldn't say that we're dependent on each other. We work together. Okay, and I also understand that you have something to show me with a printer. Actually, I do. We've uh, been doing some 3D printing, and uh, I'm calling this my honey jar. And it's, it's amazing to watch it. It printed up in separate pieces and actually screws together. The cap actually screws on the bottom and works perfectly. It's, it's just, just amazing what we're doing. Now, it's just this baby step. We're just getting started here. But uh, eventually, hopefully, we can make parts and install those parts uh, while we're in deep space. Who knows where it'll lead? But right now, I mean, this is pretty neat. Who knows where everything will lead? There have been two successful uh, space programs in the last few weeks, uh, talking about Orion and, of course, uh, uh, the issue over landing on a comet. I mean, does that make you excited? And do you see further deep space exploration? Yeah, I absolutely see further deep space, ex deep space exploration. Uh, that's really what we're about at NASA. The space station is one step, and I think hundreds of years from now we'll look back and see the space station as the first big stepping stone towards moving humans out into the solar system. Orion is an important part of that. It's the, the capsule that will allow people to get from Earth to whatever destination, Moon, Mars, uh, comets, hopefully eventually maybe the moons of Jupiter. Um, but that is a piece of that. It's just one piece of the exploration puzzle that we're going to need to put together uh, as we start to move out beyond in the solar system. And a lot of your fellow astronauts suggesting perhaps that's a bit too ambitious. Why don't you just set up a human colony on the moon for a start? Hey, that's an interesting proposition. We're all for it, but we're going to go wherever we're told to go. We're good, we're good troopers in that fashion. <laughs> well, have a wonderful Christmas up there and enjoy your spacewalks. Super, and Merry Christmas to all of y'all. Thank you very much for coming on board. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the CNN International portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from the Navy Times. Station, this is Navy Times. How do you hear me? Want it? Navy Times, we got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard. I got another cap. Hey, thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, and happy holidays to you. Happy holidays to you as well. Great. Uh, Captain Wilmore, this, uh, since I'm a Navy Times reporter, the first uh, question is for you. When you took command of the International Space Station, did you have a uh, ceremony, and uh, what did it mean for you? We actually did have a small ceremony where we handed over command. I took over from Maxim Sarai, my Russian counterpart. He's now back on Earth. They left about uh, just about a little over a month ago now, and we had a little ceremony. It was actually very nice, very special. As most of you know in the Navy, uh, as soon as you come in, you start groomed for leadership, and 
This is the first opportunity in my career, which is now but, uh, better than 20 years, that I've had opportunity to command anything. So it's it's a, it's an honor, it's a privilege to to be the guy they call commander of the International Space Station, and I'm uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Well, Captain Wilmore, uh, what are your duties and responsibilities as uh, CEO of the International Space Station, and how long are you going to be in charge? And how long? Just like the Navy, it's good order and discipline. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, there's very little, actually, there's no, no, no discipline. It's all good order. We're, you know, everybody up here is very motivated, very uh, high energy. They want to do their job and they want to perform it well. And as the guy that's in command, that's, that's obviously a very nice thing. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of direction here and there because it is different. Living in space is far, far different than living on Earth and just adapting to the environment. And, and you know, you have to think of every single thing you do. You can't just you know, place something on a table and it's there. If you let go of something, it's going to be gone. And you have to train yourself and discipline yourself every single step of everything you do and realize what you're doing and think think cognitively about what's going on or things float away and then you're in a hurt locker. Yes, sir. Uh, to Colonel Verts, uh, what projects and uh, milestones are you guys working on up there? Well, uh, every week there, it seems to be a different themed week. Last week, uh, Butch and I worked on the carbon dioxide removal equipment. It was a big, giant project that uh, luckily we were able to repair. This week, he and Samantha, are, well, another one of our crewmates, are working on my spacesuit. So I've been, I've, I've been down there keeping an eye to make sure they're doing a good job on it because I'm about to go out into space in that thing next month. Um, but that's kind of the theme of this week for them. For me, it's human research. Uh, the last two days have been a lot of tests on me for my eye. We've done ultrasounds, uh, a machine called an OCT scanner, uh, another camera, an infrared camera that's been looking into my eye. We're trying to study the effects of space on eye um, health and try and learn how to maybe improve eye health on Earth and also here in space for us astronauts. Oh, it's interesting. Uh, I for both of you, it, it's obviously been a, an exciting week in uh, space exploration with the launch of the Orion aircraft, uh, or excuse me, the space capsule. Uh, what does this new capsule mean for the space program, and are either of you looking to hitch a ride on the Orion capsule anytime soon? Shotgun. <laughs> I think we both love to fly on Orion. Uh, Orion's a very important, a very important part of... Uh, the, the future of our space program. It's, a, it's not the entire program, but it's an important part of it because that's the capsule that get, les, allows people to leave Earth and come back to Earth uh, at very high speeds. Right now we're going to 17,000 miles an hour in Earth orbit, but when you're coming back from the moon or Mars or other places in the solar system, you'd be going over 25,000, which is a lot higher and you need a lot um, sturdier capsule for that. So Orion is the part of the system that's going to allow us to get there and back and um so it's a it was a big day it was very good news for america and for nasa that 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 it worked uh, as well as it did yes sir um the i hear you guys have a 3d printer up there uh what are you uh using it for and uh what does it add to the mission up there in the international space station well, actually, we are, we're just, this is just taking baby steps. We're just getting started. It just arrived on the last uh, cargo vehicle that came up, and we just installed it a couple, about three weeks ago, and we're just starting to print objects out. And, uh, you know, you've got to walk before you run, and we're in, the, we're in the walking stage right now, learning about the aspects of the weightless environment, what it does to this type of device, and we've learned a great deal. As a matter of fact, I've got in my hand here a little jar that was printed just the uh, uh, day before yesterday. And it's it printed in two separate pieces. They printed at the same time, two separate pieces. And it actually, just a little jar, and it actually screws together and works. The lid goes on the jar, and it's a, it's a perfect, perfect fit. So it's amazing the things you can do. And imagine, imagine if this was metal, which, which we hope to maybe do one day. We can make parts. We can make uh, uh, tools to install parts. And so the, the capabilities and the possibilities are absolutely endless with this technology. Yes, sir. Uh both of you, like your uh, distinguished predecessors, are uh, test pilots. What qualities do service members uh, generally, and test pilots specifically, uh, bring to the space program? Well, that's an interesting question. I've never really pondered that. I think, you know, in, in, in the test work, you have to be disciplined. Uh, you, you plan before you fly a test. 
you execute your plan. You don't deviate from that plan. And I think space flight is very, very similar. Like, like Terry said, we're working on a spacesuit. We briefed our plan. We got with the guys on the ground that, that, that went through those procedures and developed the procedures. And we briefed together. And we are going by the plan. There are some deviations we have to take along the way because that's where the, where the, the details lead us. But we are tied together and we're disciplined in our approach. We're disciplined in our techniques to accomplish the task and the goals that are set before us. And I think there's a, that's where the primary similarities are. Roger. Um, so for uh, either or both of you, uh, what advice would you give to service members or troops that were interested in joining the space program? Um, it takes a lot of uh, effort, a lot of discipline, like I said. And if you've got a dream, something you wanted to, that you desire to do, whatever it is, progress down that road. You know, all my dreams have not come true. The things, so many things that I've desired to do in my life didn't happen. But I learned a great deal, and the journey is what's been thrilling. The goal's not always the great thing. Now, being here, obviously, it's, it's special, it's terrific, but the journey has been even better. So I would say enjoy the journey. And while I'm talking to the, about the troops, I would like to, to say that uh, um, there's many people in the Navy, other, all our other forces around the globe right now, many are separated from their families, and I want to thank them for their sacrifice, and I want them to know that what they are doing is worth it because freedom is worth the sacrifices you make. So thank you to each and every one of you. Yes, sir. Um, and uh, talk to me a little bit about where you see the future of spaceflight going. Uh, obviously, there's the Orion capsule, and and uh, there's been some increasing uh, commercial participation in space flight. Could you talk a little bit about where you see this going and, and the sort of the synergy that's created between uh, the private and public sector in space exploration? Yes, I think, uh, like I was saying before, I think the space station is a great first step as we move out into the solar system. Uh, using the new commercial model that we've used for uh, cargo delivery to the space station and hopefully for crew delivery here in a few years. Um, that can, we hope, reduce the cost of uh, getting to space, which of course has been pretty high in the past. And by reducing that cost, hopefully we can imp increase the m amount of access that we have. But in the long term, I think Mars is really the place that everybody acknowledges that we need to go. Uh, it's a planet very similar to Earth. It had, it had a history somewhat similar to Earth. There's water there. There's a thin atmosphere there. And uh, it's probably the place in the solar system that's most able to be inhabited by humans eventually. So um, the work we're doing now is really, in the long term, is going to um, help us get to Mars, I think. Thank you. There's uh, been increasing tensions here on Earth between the U.S. and Russian militaries. And I'm wondering if any of that has manifested itself up there in the International Space Station. I can tell you throughout our training and my three months on board, uh, absolutely none at all. If it wasn't for the news, I would not know there were any tensions whatsoever because in the jobs that we do day to day, day in, day out, the, the Russian trainers that we had when we were in Star City, Russia, training prior to launch, uh, there was no tension whatsoever, no discussion about it, and then very kind, very cordial. Those people are passionate about their work, passionate about training us for what we're doing now, so uh, you'd never know anything about it. And uh, Captain Wilmore, last question to you. Uh, what's more stressful, uh, landing on an aircraft carrier or docking with the International Space Station? There is very little, very few things in life that are more stressful than landing on an aircraft carrier at night in bad weather. Actually, there's nothing more stressful. That, that's the coup de grace. That's the top of the list. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time out, and uh, good luck on your mission, and uh, thanks for joining us. And thank you, and uh, hello to all your listeners, and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. Thank you, CNN International and the Navy Times. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.